Good afternoon, everybody. This is Annie Ansana. I'm a Senior Director of Educator Preparation. I'm joined with my colleague, Tiffany Dellert, our Senior Project Manager um, for the Office of Educator Licensure and Preparation. Um, we're happy that you are here to join us for our EPP literacy proposal for uh, overview for middle and secondary ELA programs today. Um, we have an additional colleague, uh, Lindsay Nelson. She has joined the department in August, and she's here with us until the end of December as our EPP literacy consultant. She couldn't join us for the webinar uh, today, but we um, wanted to recognize that she's part of our team now and um, has really brought some additional capacity, and we um, feel very fortunate that, that we have her. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started. We gave you a couple notes here at the beginning um, as we were, as folks were locking in. Um, we recommend that you have the ELA Middle and Secondary Proposal Template and Rubric documents accessible while we're walking through things. Um, these were published in both the Literacy uh, Edition, Special Edition of the EPP Update, as well as um, on Monday, the September Edition of the EPP Update as well. If you do not have these documents, please email Tiffany and she can, her address, email address is posted up here on the first slide and she is able to, um, she'll be able to send those documents to you. Um, just as a reminder, all participants are muted upon entry to the webinar and um, we will keep you muted through the webinar to avoid any sort of feedback or um, issues regarding audio. But we do encourage you, if you have any questions, via, um, to send those via chat box to Tiffany uh, during the webinar, and we will try our best to get those questions answered. If we can't address them during the webinar, we can, we're happy to follow up um, through phone call or email, and of course, we'll be talking at length about these proposals at the next October 29th Literacy Network meeting. So let's get started. We have a, a very full agenda today. Um, the, the two objectives that we have for this webinar is first to deepen or develop or deepen participant understanding of the EPP literacy proposal process. As we see folks logging into this webinar, I'm very happy to see um, folks that have already engaged with the early elementary and special education proposal process. Um, your expertise will be really handy to have um, as you engage with this next set of endorsements. There will be a lot of overlap in connection making through this webinar from that first process. If you're new to this, um, I would encourage you to reach out to the literacy lead that um, was primarily responsible for drafting and engaging with the work done for early elementary and special education. Um, they'll be a really good um, partner to have on hand to, to support you through this. And of course, the literacy network meeting um, will be an opportunity for you to really network and uh, work with folks across the state um, for, to, to support the work on this literacy uh, requirement. Second objective today, too, is to familiarize participants with the EDP literacy proposal template requirements and the rubric criteria. That's where we will spend the bulk of our time today. So just a brief overview of our agenda. We've got um, proposal process overview, we'll spend just a little bit of time kind of understanding the context and the history for why we're engaging in this process and some of those expectations. We'll talk briefly about our pro um, proposal structure, but spend the bulk of the time talking about the comprehensive questions and the rubric expectations, specifically talking about the questions that we're asking, um, providing some guidance to think about and to use while you're drafting and to um, go into a bit more detail about the rubric expectations for each of those comprehensive questions. Um, it's time, we'll talk uh, just briefly about the review process for our reviewers and then the submission process, but those, those, the review process and submission process will be talked about at length at our October 29th meeting as well. And so if you have additional questions about that, I would suggest and encourage you um, to wait until we get um, to that meeting to ask those in detail or again, of course, send us an email. Um, so let's get started with our EPP literacy proposal overview. Um, just a bit of context here, the EPP literacy standards were approved by the State Board of Education in 2017. Uh, all of these standards um, for ELA middle and secondary are located in our educator preparation policy 
5.504. We do not give you a link because we, we really encourage you to go to our tn.gov backslash SBE site. Um, the state board, anytime there are revisions to standards or policies, um, they don't revise the link, they um, revise the attachment. And so we encourage you to actually go to that, um, to our site and download um, the most recent educator preparation policy and I believe that would be dated July of 2018. Um, the, the ELA, the EPP literacy standards for ELA programs are really tightly aligned with the Tennessee ELA academic standards and, and we try to make some of the, we'll try and make some of those connections for you through this webinar as well. This is a one-time proposal process that's required for all initial licensure ELA middle and secondary programs. We'll talk a bit more about the endorsements required here shortly. Um, our timeline for standards implementation, proposals for middle and secondary ELA programs are due on January 28th. For those of you that are familiar, we'll continue to use our um, file serving or file sharing service, Dropbox, and we'll get you set up with those accounts and get you what you need to know a little bit um, later within the process. Notifications of proposals that meet expectations or need revisions will occur uh, no later than March, to, uh, March 11th, 2019. Um, this is an iterative review, and so for those of you that are less familiar, um, if proposals do not meet expectations by, um, around that due date of March 11th, there will be an opportunity for EPPs to revise any proposal responses that did not meet expectations and resubmit in April of 2019. And again, if proposals do not meet that second time, they'll have a second chance to make revisions um, and submit those June 2019. Um, and again, we'll shore up those dates as um, the review process is underway. The expectation is all of these standards will be implemented um, by fall of 2019. In regards to the proposal structure, there are three main parts. There's the identification of endorsements. There's part two, which is really um, about the breadth of standards alignment, um, showing um, the uh, sort of the breadth of coverage of standards within your literacy preparation um, courses within your individual programs. And then part three, the um, narrative responses to the comprehensive questions so let's talk a bit about this endorsement table. Um, this is not unlike the early elementary special education program uh, or process. We review these proposals at the program level. And what a program entails is um, identification of the endorsement, um, such as middle grades, ELA um, for grades six through eight, and then um, at the level, either undergraduate or post-bac, and then with the clinical types of so student teaching, internship, or job embedded. And so when you see this um, table on your proposal template, whatever your EPP offers um, that leads to initial licensure, you will check the boxes for which this, pro, um, this proposal will align to um, these particular endorsements. We got a really good question at the TAPTI meeting uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and the question was, what if, all, what if the middle grade, for example, the middle grade ELA program is distinctively different than the, than the secondary um, English program? And I, I have some thoughts on that one as well. What we've designed here is that all of these proposed, all of these endorsements will be combined on a single proposal. But if you're starting to see vast differences many distinctions across your programs and um, the need to go way beyond the word count uh, to be able to respond to the, the comprehensive questions, then I encourage you to reach out to us. Um, you can contact me or you can contact Lindsay and talk to us about what we can do to help support you in ensuring that your, your programs are, are covered um, because we will ask for distinctions across those programs as well. Standards alignment, um, again, this table should look very familiar if, you, if you've done this process before. Um, what we ask for here is for you to record the course, course or module name and to um, indicate when the timing of those courses are. So, for example, you might say 
um, fall semester year one or junior year spring semester for that course timing. Um, for every course that um, embed the EPP literacy standards, you will um, check the appropriate boxes in which those standards are embedded. Um, there is an expectation that across your program, you will embed all of the literacy standards somewhere. Um, the candidate assessments are, what we're asking for here is um, just titles of the assessment names. For example, um, you will see a name of, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, the journal reflection um, may be an assessment that's used to assess one, uh, one or more of the standards. You might also um, record individual names of uh, assessments that are derived at the EPP level here just, just to show um, that these standards are assessed in some way. Finally, the literacy and non-literacy specific checkbox. Um, what we're encouraging is EPPs to not um, just think about the literacy specific courses that are part of a program, um, but to also think about the non-literacy specific courses such as an assessment course or an RTI course or a general methods courses that might also embed those standards. Um, so again, we want to spend the bulk of our time talking about um, part three, which is the comprehensive questions. There are four questions uh, uh, as part of this proposal process. Part three is broken down to 3A, 3B, 3C, and 3D. Um, generally speaking, we wanna, uh, we'll inquire about your program sequence, uh, your clinical experiences, the candidate assessments that are, are tightly aligned to the TN academic standards, and also address student differences. Um, before we dig deep into each one of these uh, questions, I did want to um, highlight something that we learned from the early elementary special education process. And this is the, word, the use of the word evidence. Um, we use the word evidence um, broadly speaking. Evidence can be found in both narrative responses as well as attachments. Um, we do not want to use the word evidence and attachments interchangeably. Um, what we've learned is that can cause a lot of confusion both for the EPPs who are drafting responses as well um, as for the reviewers who are reviewing those responses. Um, attachments are going, we'll talk a bit about attachments. For this particular proposal, we are only requiring attachments for question three. Now, EPPs um, may have the opportunity to um, include attachments as additional evidence to support their narrative responses for questions one, two, and four um, if they feel um, like they need additional space to be able to provide um, that description or rationale for the responses. And we'll, we'll talk a bit about that, but I always want to make that clarification um, right from the get-go that we use that term evidence broadly and evidence can be found in both narrative responses as well as attachments. So as you approach the drafting process, um, what we encourage you to think about across all four of these um, comprehensive question responses um, is that the narrative responses should really present the primary argument and evidence. Um, reviewers will be trained to look first at the narrative responses to hold the weight of the rationale or the argument to show where EPPs are aligning their responses to the rubric criteria. Um, so we really encourage EPPs to draft their responses with that in mind. Um, attachments, again, should be used to support the narrative responses just to provide that additional detail or explanation. We encourage EPPs to write with proposal requirements in mind, and what that means is we know that you're doing a lot of excellent things in your ELA middle and secondary programs, and much of which may align already with the rubric criteria, but what we don't want to happen is for EPPs to sort of retrofit what they're already doing to fit the proposal requirements. Um, we encourage you to, to take what those um, requirements are and think about those first and think about elements of what you already do that may work, um, but then to, to draft again with those requirements in mind first and foremost. Um, please write for an audience external to your EPP. Um, your reviewers will be uh, 
will come from backgrounds of education and uh, have experience with literacy instruction, but they may not know all the ins and outs of what your EPP does. So again, sort of avoiding those acronyms and making things very explicit for that external audience. Um, it's best if you use that language directly from the rubric. Um, reviewers are able to pinpoint exactly what they're looking for in that regard. Um, when we talked about the distinctions across programs, if you offer, say, both a middle grade and a secondary program, we want to make those distinctions where applicable within those narrative responses. Um, these, we'll talk a bit about this later, but these um, proposals will be reviewed holistically. That means that each reviewer will review, will review the proposal in its entirety. So it's very helpful if you're referencing information in um, question one, for example, that reviewers will then see again or make a connection to a response in question three. So we, call, we talk about this as being kind of essentially road mapping. Um, so it's really helpful kind of um, to, to do that within your responses to support the review process. Attachments and word count limitations will apply. Word count limitations are already noted in your proposal template, and we'll talk more about those attachment um, limitations shortly. So this is just a brief overview of what, um, what you need to know about the rubric. Um, you should have a copy of that rubric in front of you. Each, um, each question will be reviewed using this rubric, and uh, Question response can fall either in the below approaching or meets expectation rating category. This rubric is also helpful to reference the attachment um, guidelines. So you can see for question one here for program sequence, EPPs can choose to include optional attachments such as core syllabi or pro program course or module sequences within this. But again, the, the primary weight will, will fall within that narrative response. So let's really look into um, diving deep into these questions. For question one, we have, uh, we're asking about program sequence and, and we're asking explicitly to describe how the literacy program sequence demonstrates coherence and increases in complexity and depth over time. This is not unlike what we asked for the early elementary and special education um, proposal process. What we know from the research is that um, that candidate development of literacy knowledge and skills and strategies um, are best, um, are, candidates are most successful when programs build in complexity over time. And so rather than having sort of isolated courses that do a little bit here and then um, are, are um, introducing candidates into things over here, we really want to see what that, um, what building of that uh, depth and complexity over time looks like. So we encourage, this is some of the drafting guidance that we wanted to provide. Strong responses will be more than, um, more complex than a simple description of the program of study. You can include that program of study, but what we're looking for is for that intentionality of that program sequence over time. So um, what you might see is there, there, there should be a reason why we offer, say, something like an integrated literacy course first um, before um, candidates take a, a more complex um, course over time. Uh, and the ways that EPPs can show that intentionality is by using terminology such as introduced, reinforced, and assessed. So you may include a program of study, but then we're looking for you know, concepts such as um, A, B, and C will first be introduced in this course, and then they will be reinforced in the second course in these particular ways, and then assessed um, in, in, these, in these subsequent courses um, thereafter. So we're really looking for intentionality um, in, in your program design for question one. With the rubric expectations, we got a lot of questions about the use of a scoring notes guide. Um, this is a document that was provided um, for EPPs during the revision process um, should, should uh, EPPs have needed revision. The scoring notes guide provided some real explicit narrowed focus on the rubric criteria. and. Um, uh, that document is in development for our ELA middle and secondary programs. 
um, it's not available quite yet. And so what we wanted to do at this webinar is sort of highlight criteria in the rubrics um, for each individual question, areas that EPP should um, sort of primarily put their focus on. We want to reiterate that all of the criteria we put in the rubric we think is um, really essential to um, program design and what we think candidates need to, to learn and be exposed to um, during preparation. Um, but we also know that there are, there are particular areas that we, we may want to focus on primarily. And so, um, for example, within question one, um, well, I want to bring your attention to bullets one and two. Um, this is where we want to, again, reiterate that concepts um, related to the standards are introduced, reinforced, assessed, and integrated within practice as that program um, grows in complexity. We also want to consider the development of the candidates. Uh, what are they able to do on their own? What are they able to attain with um, sort of this assistance and guidance from instructors or mentors or peers? And so again, if um, the focus is on those particular two bullets, um, we think that EPPs will be successful in providing responses to that question. I'm going to move on here to question two, which is really, which is focused on clinical experiences. Um, the question asks for EPVs to describe how clinical experiences are designed to build on each other in ways that support candidate developmental understanding of teaching literacy. Uh, I first want to clarify what we mean by clinical experiences. Uh, sort of a, an overarching term that not only includes student teaching, but could, might also include early field experiences or candidates' opportunities to engage in observations. And so it's a, it's a more inclusive term and in how we're using it and defining it for this proposal review process. Um, strong responses uh, that are, will include a more complex than a simple dis description of the structure and duration of clinical experiences. So some documents that come to mind are thinking about maybe your clinical experiences handbook that you use for supervisors or mentors um, or even for candidates themselves. We're looking for a little bit more intentionality behind um, why the clinical experiences are structured in a way that makes sense for candidate development. Um, we really encourage EPPs to be explicit about the candidate expectations, and we also want to consider and, and um, have EPPs show how these clinical experiences are appropriate for candidate development. Um, what you'll see when we get to this next slide here um, is that we are looking for candidate experiences designed with that gradual release of responsibility where there are clear opportunities for candidates to, for example, observe uh, classroom instruction, engage in co-planning, co-teaching, and co-assessing. That we know from, from research that candidates should be analyzing instructional materials and curriculum um, first before they graduate and um, move on to creating their own um, curricular materials and um, instructional plans. And so you can see how um, these bulleted, um, these bullets within the second rubric, the second question for the, within the rubric sort of follow a gradual release of responsibility. And what I would um, also encourage EPPs is to think about um, including all opportunities they have throughout those clinical experiences, particularly touching on at least three of these bullets listed here um, to show that gradual release of responsibility. Um, so let's move on talk a bit about question three. Um, for 3A and 3D is all focused on candidate assessments. There's language that we've used in here that says other than the EdTPA and practice assessments. And we've gotten a couple questions about that already, and I wanted to provide some clarification around this. When we say other than EdTPA, what we're talking about is the officially scored portfolio that is submitted to Pearson that is excluded. What we know is that EPPs are doing a lot of great work to prepare candidates to take the EdTPA. All of that is, is, should be definitely included within the responses for question 3A through D here, 
as applicable. So we don't want to count out all the good work that you're doing with your candidates to prepare for the NTPA and see that there could be a lot of um, great work that might be um, included that would also align to the expectations we have here for 3A through D. So I just wanted to make that clarification. So um, what the expectation here is that we want EPPs to submit at least two candidate assessments to address 3A, B, C, and D. Um, in the past, we've had uh, EPPs design um, much more comprehensive assessments that may strand through an entire course or across multiple courses that may address these um, uh, expectations that we have listed in, in question three. That's perfectly acceptable. Um, EPPs might also develop um, assessments that are distinctive. We might have four distinctive assessments that address one for 3A, one for 3B, et cetera. Also um, completely acceptable. We don't want to prescribe to you the expectations here, but we do want to see evidence of how these assessments are aligning to this particular uh, criteria. So strong responses for 3A through D. Um, we really want EPPs to again think within the narrative responses, um, provide that rationale and argument for how the assessments are achieving their purpose and how they are aligned to each um, particular area that we've lined out. We also require evidence for question three, which means we want to see the actual candidate assessment. We um, think that it's very important for EPPs to include the scoring mechanisms that are used to evaluate the candidate assessments um, to really drive home the importance of um, the alignment to um, these expectations. So again, candidate assessment for question three, evidence, I'm sorry, attachments are required for this question. Let's look at each of these individually and go into detail about what we mean when we say, for example, analyze, select, and use complex text for instruction. Um, if you're looking at your rubric expectations for 3A, we, again, are focusing on that meets expectations language as um, that sort of the, um, what we expect EPPs to be considering as they're drafting uh, their responses. The focus here is for at least one of the submitted assessments to, um, to require candidates to analyze, select, and use complex text for instruction. So we, we did write the expectation here that evidence from this assessment, um, you, and again, evidence either in that narrative response or and or within the required attachments will show how candidates will do the four following bullets. So again, the expectation is that there will be evidence for each of these four bullets. But let me help you kind of get narrowed and thinking about um, what you might want to prioritize as you're drafting. When you're looking at the second bullet that says analyze a wide range of complex texts um, and provide rationales for text selection, I really want to emphasize the importance of this bullet. Um, when we talk about complex texts, we're talking about how we're engaging candidates to understand the expectations of quantitative, qualitative, reader, and task um, factors as they're making, uh, as they're analyzing that, those texts, and then being able to articulate how they're making a particular selection of that text for instruction. So really want to encourage focus on that second bullet, as well as being able to use that text selection to think about pairing those texts with a variety of high quality, developmentally appropriate instructional practices. Now, the language here, I, I want everybody to kind of focus on the language um, such as, right? So if we think of such as, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to provide evidence of an interactive think aloud um, or um, varied high quality questions, but we do need to see evidence of um, those appropriate high quality instructional practices and how they're connected to those complex texts. So again, bullets one and three are still important to include but there should be a focus on bullets two and four in particular. So um, for part B, when we implement literacy assessment and analyze and interpret data to inform instruction, um, that's sort of a two-part um, thinking process here, and we included six bullets, and I know that's a lot. 
Um, but if we think in particular about um, narrowing our focus on some of these, um, let's kind of look at this expectation in chunks. The first part of 3B asks for candidates to implement quality literacy assessments. So I'm looking in particular at bullets one and two. And the expectations here is that candidates will be able to analyze and interpret the context uses and limitations of the literacy assessment, as well as think about um, those culturally relevant and responsive assessments to address the needs of all um, students. And so I would um, really focus on those first two bullets to drive home what you will be doing in preparation to address how candidates will implement those quality literacy assessments. In regards to the second part of question 3B, you'll think about analyze, how candidates will analyze and interpret data from those assessments to inform instruction. And so I would then focus on bullets four and five. And what you'll see there is that candidates will be able to identify the database trends that surface um, patterns related to students who are not progressing provide those a wide range of um, text and instruction and instruction responsive to identified needs, as well as use multiple forms of evidence to be able to make um, judgments to identify learning needs and set those explicit goals for students. So um, again, for that very first part of, of question 3B, for candidates to implement quality literacy assessments, a focus on bullets one and two. So the second part of that expectation for candidates to analyze and interpret data to inform instruction, I would be focused on um, bullets four and five in particular. Um, as we transition and talk about question 3C, how candidates, um, candidate assessments will show this evidence how candidates will deeply engage with the Tennessee academic standards to analyze and notice the, the use of the word and or create units of study. So let's look at the rubric expectations here. Again, we just really want to lean on, on this as this will be a tool that the reviewers will be using as they evaluate each proposal that, that they are expected to review. Um, there should be a focus. My eyes go directly to bullet number two where um, we are encouraging candidates to be able to recognize that vertical progression of the Tennessee academic standards and be able to articulate how the standards in previous and subsequent grades may support students' overall literacy development. I see a direct tie with this bullet with um, the expectations for 3B as we are um, uh, considering and thinking about literacy assessments. So a focus really on that second bullet in particular. Um, also, as candidates are being exposed to and thinking about that vertical progression of the standards, they're actively using and integrating multiple standards that allow students to demonstrate a mastery of grade level expectations um, within very rigorous tasks. So we do not see um, uh, teaching of isolated standards. The expectation is that as candidates understand those standards, they're able to um, make thoughtful selections of multiple standards and be able to integrate those and design those rigorous tasks. So thinking in particular about bullets um, two and four here, uh, uh, we really encourage you to, to, to think about those as you're drafting your responses to 3C. So finally, we'll transition and talk about um, 3D. Um, this is an opportunity to engage candidates in thinking and engaging students about the iterative writing process focused on textual evidence. So um, really, each one of these bullets here should be um, thought about carefully as you're drafting responses. Um, we did not call out a particular genre of writing. Um, we do know from data within um, uh, classroom observations of both students' learning and teachers' instructional practice here in our state of Tennessee, um, there is a, a need to focus on argumentative writing. Um, but we see the importance of uh, supporting candidates in understanding what is textual evidence 
um, primarily through all genres as, as being uh, our focus for, for 3D. Um, we encourage you to think about what those candidate assessments will look like um, as um, candidates may be analyzing writing samples that represent all ability levels and then also thinking in particular about what kind of relevant feedback should candidates be providing to their students um, that will support students' understanding of developing quality writing pieces. Um, and again, this is all part of what we, um, what we know as, as best practice, that writing is a process and not just a product, um, very iterative in nature. Um, so again, just really thinking about all four of these bullets as you're crafting these responses and providing those opportunities for candidates. Finally, let's um, talk about student difference. That's our question number four. Um, this should be familiar. Uh, very, very similar question is what we asked for the early elementary and special education um, proposal requirements. We're asking how the EPP will provide opportunities for candidates to demonstrate and apply knowledge of student difference as a source of strength in society to be encouraged and not discouraged. Um, what we think here in terms of strong responses, um, they will be actually, and my, I'm going to jump straight to that second sub-bullet there, but that there, there is um, actual evidence, concrete evidence that will be collected from candidates that will demonstrate learning from these opportunities. And I want to provide a bit of clarification there. Um, these proposals are about plans that will be implemented in fall in 2019. So we're not expecting that you're going to actually submit any candidate or student work. But what we are expecting that you'll submit for both question three and potentially for question four are these concrete opportunities that will be presented for candidates within coursework and clinical experiences. So again, concrete evidence just means what are your plans to engage um, candidates in talking about student difference? It may be um, providing a particular um, chapter and having a very rigorous discussion about opportunities in viewing student differences as assets and thinking about um, positioning students within these um, as valuable contributors to society regardless of their, their literacy proficiency, having that rich conversation within courses, um, you know, between candidate peers, with that, with the instructors, and potentially having candidates reflect within maybe a, a journal um, journal entry that will then be submitted. So we want there to be some concrete opportunity that's provided to be able to address the criteria in question four. When we look at the rubric here, um, I really want you to, to focus particularly on the first three sub bullets, positioning students as knowledgeable and valuable contributors, encouraging that differentiated literacy instruction, and then using students' cultural and linguistic histories as resources for literacy development instruction. This is really, um, this language is pulled directly from the standards. Um, this is the expectations um, for candidates to um, provide that particular mindset that we're looking for as they're teaching students of various backgrounds. Um, so a focus in particular on those first three bullets. Um, the last two bullets are, are also important. I don't want to minimize their importance. Um, these are a little bit more focused on the candidates, um, on the candidates themselves. We're really challenging, um, providing opportunities for candidates to challenge their own deficit thinking that they may be bringing into the classroom and as they're, they're thinking about um, children that they're instructing, to challenge their own sociocultural biases related to student differences and to really support um, a development of cultural knowledge within that candidate um, so that they can really be advocates for our, our students with differences. So we're actually doing pretty well on time. Um, I want to transition, talk a little bit about the review process. Um, for some, this will be a, a reiteration of what we have done with the early elementary and special education process. Um, for, the, for folks who don't know, each proposal that is submitted will be reviewed three times by external reviewers. 
So um, we will be putting out a call for proposals, and we encourage any of you on this call that may be interested in serving as a reviewer um, to apply once that proposal, um, call for proposal goes live. We expect that will be um, sometime in October. Um, so we, we, what we've learned is that many who have engaged in the drafting process for early elementary and special education who are also reviewers just um, gained a lot of insight that was really supportive of their own literacy preparation at their own EPP. So we not only are um, recruiting EPP literacy um, uh, reviewers, but we also reach out to our LEA community and um, recruit to try and have a blend of LEA and EPP reviewers. So each proposal that's submitted is reviewed three times by external reviewers. Again, this is a holistic review process. Um, each reviewer will review, uh, will read the entire proposal and then provide ratings for each comprehensive question. Um, as I stated before, reviewer, reviewers will re rely very heavily on the rubric to score each question per proposal. And these reviews are actually um, double blind, and that means that um, the reviewers don't know what EPP they are reviewing, and the EPP does not know who the reviewers are when they get those um, reviews back. Um, just briefly again, um, with the submission process, um, we encourage you as you begin drafting, um, you want you must draft your responses on the department's syllable. Adobe PDF template. This is the one that was published in our EPP update. So um, please ensure that, that, that the um, drafting is occurring on that particular template. Please adhere to the narrative word count. Um, there, there's a word count limit for each question. Um, they range between approximately 1,000 to 1,500 words per response. Um, the reviewers will be instructed to stop reading should the, um, the responses go more than what the word limit applies. Um, there will be attachment limitations, and we'll talk more about those at the October 29th um, meeting. What that means is we really discourage EPPs from submitting, say, like 35-page syllabi, um, because what that does is it, it sort of um, creates a, an environment where reviewers may get fatigued and are not pointing the reviewers in the direction of the evidence that will best support their rationale and arguments. And so we'll provide for you um, those attachment limitations at the October 29th meeting. And we'll also talk a, a lot about naming conventions to, again, adhere um, to um, uh, keeping those reviews blind and ensuring there's no identifiable information there. Um, we also encourage EPPs to, while they're drafting, to avoid using their EPP's name um, or to think of a pseudonym. Um, also the same as, you know, if there are attachments that will be included to try and remove all of that before they are submitted. Um, we just are trying to avoid having to do work on the back end or to um, avoid having to send your proposal back to you to do um, some redacting. So please um, think about that as you're drafting and remove all of that identifiable information. For any attachments that are included, please save all of these as PDFs. And again, all of these will be uploaded through our file hosting service, Dropbox, and we'll get some more details on that as our submission deadline um, comes closer. So next step, we, um, as you know, and registration is now open for our October 29th meeting. Our Literacy Network meeting will be hosted at the Cool Springs Marriott in Franklin. Um, this will be from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. This will be... Um, an opportunity for EPPs to work with their own colleagues in drafting responses. There will be opportunities for EPPs to ask questions of PDOE staff. Um, and there will be time for us um, to present some examples to narrative responses, not exemplars, but examples, to help EPPs kind of navigate what an example of response to rubric criteria might look like and try to answer any of those sorts of um, more detailed content-specific questions that EPPs have. So we really encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to register yet, 
um, that you uh, make sure that there is representation from your EPP at this meeting. Um, another little bit of advice here is that this meeting not just focus on the ELA middle and secondary, but we'll also be um, uh, talking about our instructional leader proposal requirements as well as the non-ELA middle secondary CTE and pre-K-12 um, proposal pr um, requirements as well. So a lot of time to network with um, EPP partners from across the state and try to generate ideas and, and just talk with like colleagues about um, what you're doing in literacy preparation. Um, in addition to the October 29th meeting, you uh, may already be familiar with that we're hosting two additional webinars. Our, on October 1st at 1 p.m. Central Time, we'll host our instructional leader program, should your EPP offer that, and um, encourage EPPs to attend, as well as on October 9th will be our webinar for the non-ELA uh, middle secondary pre-K-12 and CTE programs. So again, really encourage you to attend those and just be as knowledgeable as you can about the requirements and the rubric expectations before coming to that October 29th meeting. I wanted to put our contact information up here um, again. Um, I have uh, transitioned roles. Um, from the Director of Literacy for, for, ed, for Educator Preparation, but I still manage uh, all of the literacy work. And again, we are um, very thankful to have the additional capacity that Lindsay provides for us as our EPP literacy consultant. So if you have any questions about proposal content or expectations, please feel free to reach out to either one of us um, via email. Um, generally gets us, um, gets responses Factor. Um, again, you're also welcome to, to give us a call or set up a call as well. Um, at this point, I am finished with the content for our webinar, but I will pause here to see if there are any additional um, questions that either came um, to Tiffany during the webinar or if you um, want to hang on for another couple minutes and ask some of those questions. We just want to thank everybody again for attending. Um, again, we'll, we'll send out the links to this webinar recording um, as soon as we have it available. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out and we're happy to, to support you as you're uh, engaging in this drafting process. So um, hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week and we will see you on October 29th.